Hello and welcome. Reads is a text-only segment that began in service number 175 and concluded in number 186. The first six parts are a veiled look at the comic book industry of the era. In literary terms, this is called a novel with a key. If one is familiar with the people involved and the series of events, one can easily see through the veiled references and interpret exactly whom is being discussed. In comic books, the best example is the second volume of Mage. All the characters are based on people known by Matt Wagner, and the story itself is a highly allegorical look at his career. Reads are a part of the Cerebus universe. They are a pamphlet that's a cross between a penny dreadful and a comic book, so they are salacious stories with lurid illustrations. Beginning with issue number 181 until issue number 186, the protagonist of Reed's, Victor Davis, steps forward as a narrator speaking directly to the audience. There is no doubt whatsoever this is actually the writer slash artist, Dave Sim, speaking through a character that is a transparent version of himself. Again, to use a literary term, Sim breaks the fourth wall during these segments. The voice of the narration is, in part, the poetic wanderings of Oscar Wilde, who Sim was familiar with, having written extensively about the man in both Jocka Story and Melmoth, mixed with the rambling, drawn-out sentences of the political commentator William F. Buckley Jr. In other words, to use a generous term, the sentences are elliptical, providing asides and context that aren't strictly necessary. It meanders, quite frequently. Yet, it evokes a sense of authority and intellectualism, bordering on condescending pretentiousness. In contrast to these text pieces is the actual story taking place in Cerebus. It is told in almost total silence, as Cerebus and Siren battle to determine who will be the ruling force of the Church. So, it is a man and a woman locked in deadly combat, trying to determine who has the most power. That is a fair amount of context for a segment of Cerebus that will become notorious and savagely criticized for decades to come. The relevant part of Reed's, the object of this discussion, is the fourth wall-breaking essay that began in issue number 181 and ended in issue number 186. The final issue in this segment categorically ended Sim's career and ensured that he remained an outcast, derided and ignored by a significant portion of the industry. Not without reason, it should be noted. So let's examine that reason. Reeds begins off with Dave Sim looking for an allegory for himself. He settles on a combination of Jeff Smith, James Stewart's character from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Shahirazad, the woman who told tales daily in order to save her life in 1001 Arabian Nights, and then he adds in the Sword of Damocles to suggest his life could end at any time. This is an apt allusion. Sim is a storyteller, ranting and raving to make a point, acknowledging that what he's about to reveal will likely kill his career. If nothing else, at least Sim has enough self-awareness to realize this is a highly misguided venture. This is followed by establishing the tone and atmosphere of the forthcoming rambling essay. He tries to create a shared place where the author and the audience join together. It also establishes that Sim feels like an authority figure in what he has to discuss. The following is his experience. To use a modern term, this is his truth. This concludes the first part. The recurring theme of the next part is the phrase, what are you thinking? Sim provides snapshots, small, seemingly memorable thoughts as they occur to him. The point being, his thoughts are random and have no personal theme, or for that matter, any meaning. They're just thoughts and have no significance. At one point, Sim does engage in some well-known intellectual dishonesty. He equates scientific theory with a belief structure or a system of faith. This is entirely inaccurate. Science is a process, not a belief system. The results are objectively true and repeatable, regardless of one's belief or faith in the theory or the results. For example, even if everyone on the planet believed the Earth to be a flat plane, the world would still be an oblong spheroid, slowly rotating around the gravity well of a star 150 million kilometers away. This is happening right now, regardless of whether you believe that to be true. This isn't a point worth belaboring, but it is a notable flaw in Sim's reasoning process. Or to be accurate, the process he believes to be reasonable and objective. It isn't. It's entirely subjective. The next chapter is Sim obliquely discussing the origin of his ideas. To begin with, the reader is plunged into darkness, an empty void that represents Sim's mind. From there, Sim rambles on about ideas in general, theorizing that his ideas lay in the darkness. This is where he intends to lead the reader into his darkness.
In the next part, the reader is given an all-access pass to Victor Davis, also known as Dave Sim. He then makes an unnecessary, unrelated point that comic books are not rock and roll. However, it does lead to what will be the beginning of Sim's argument. The bulk of this piece is Sim showing the reader something he doesn't describe in any detail. This something is, allegedly, sublime. It is an awe-inspiring him. Additionally, he equates a nondescript her with the blackness of a void and the emptiness of space. Objectively, the entire piece is mostly nonsense. But it gets worse. The penultimate part begins with the reader watching the awe-inspiring male entity metaphorically and literally ejaculating into the female void. This becomes a highly strained metaphor where the awe-inspiring him attempts to please the empty void of her, to no avail. The entire entry is pure poetic nonsense. For most people, it will stretch the boundaries of their patience. Sim thinks he's saying something profound, using a prolonged metaphor that becomes increasingly unnecessary the longer it's used. This is an endurance test of boring non-sequiturs mixed with some disturbingly simplistic imagery. However, the point being made is this. Men are creative and filled with light. Women are voids that leech off men and destroy that light. The stage, such as it is, is now set for the final act. Now, one would presume the preceding five parts would be the basis of the argument in the final part, but that's presuming there's an argument to be finalized. There isn't one. What one gets is Sim's opinion concerning gender politics and its influence. Now, to get a bit more granular, an argument is supported by fact and reason. An opinion is a subjective piece based on one person's experience. It may sound reasonable, and many may suggest it is, but it is not based on reason. It is mostly observational, speculative, and anecdotal. This distinction is important. It's important to note that Sim is not presenting an argument. He is expressing an opinion. He may be arguing that opinion, but he is not making an argument. The main concern, if it can be boiled down to one thing, is that Sim objects to people making decisions based on how they feel, rather than what they think. The blame for that trend is the female influence on society. Now, what follows is a thorough point-by-point -point breakdown. In fact, this may seem a bit pedantic. However, it's being done to underscore the lack of a narrative thread throughout the essay. This is a collection of biased observations that don't gel into a coherent argument. Any conclusions one does make, they arrive at on their own. In this modern age, there is a female void and the male light. Roughly translated, that means there is more emotion and less reason. Sim assures the reader he has extensive notes about the topic. Within logical fallacies, this is known as the argument from authority. The subtext being, his opinion should be given weight because he's done a lot of reading. This is followed by a JFK anecdote where the former president humorously states he's never been in love. There is a critique of journalism proposing that it is based on the question, how do you feel, rather than, what do you think? Exactly one example, concerning an interview with a pregnant teen girl, is cited. This alleged journalistic preponderance on emotion rather than reason is blamed on the female void. Sim then pauses for an allegory that blatantly states women eat the brains of men. These men are willfully stupid, according to Sim. For those that don't know, this is both a straw man argument and an ad hominem attack. This is followed by a section on something identified as merged permanence. This is, generally speaking, a relationship between a man and a woman. Sim then goes on to assert that emotions and decision-making has ruined Western society. Again, this is the fault of all women everywhere and their willfully stupid male accomplices. The Declaration of Independence is cited as a brilliant piece of work created by illuminated male thinkers. It is based on reason rather than emotion. Concurrently, he complains that elections are won on how a candidate makes an audience feel. A candidate does not win based on their credentials, experience, or reason. They win due to the content of their female-approved character. This is followed by the suggestion that deep thoughts only occur when alone. A consensus opinion, especially one where a woman is involved, goes nowhere and accomplishes nothing. Sim then states JFK's son is not enlightened. It is then stated that consensus opinion overall is based on emotion rather than reason. This statement conveniently ignores that the Declaration of Independence was based on a consensus opinion between a group of men. Therefore, following the argument, this illuminated document is emotion-based, according to the reasoning provided by Sim. 
It's alleged that a wife and children, and the pressures of maintaining this merged permanence, is a waste of time and effort, which leads to the degradation of society. It goes into conspiracy theory territory by suggesting that corporations prefer married men with a family because this ensures their subservience to the corporation. Another example of a man getting his metaphorical brains eaten by a woman follows. Then there's two non sequiturs and an anecdote about Mobius. Sim mentions he prefers a series of sexual partners rather than committing to one. Sim then advocates for being alone and isolated. He doesn't state the benefits of this choice, he only lists the negative aspects of living with a woman. Quote, If you look at her and see anything besides emptiness, fear, and emotional hunger, you are looking at the parts of yourself which have been consumed to that point. Unquote. It is then argued that women are not muses. Some out-of-context quotes from Jack Nicholson are next, and then an anecdote about Picasso ignoring his wife and mistress fighting. Another anecdote with Alan Moore follows. After that, Sim admits he'd rather have a string of lovers rather than one constant partner. Sex is then equated as being gold, while emotions are equated as being paper currency. In other words, sex is more valuable than, say, love. However, according to Sim, women believe the opposite. This is followed by a statement that sex in a relationship diminishes over time. The blame for which is placed on women. And withdrawing sex is the only real power a woman has. It is suggested this may be the leading cause of domestic violence. Conveniently overlooked is the fact that diminishing returns for sex between a long-term couple occurs on both sides of the equation. Not to mention, this includes the standard, erroneous implication that women do not pursue sex for their own pleasure. Sim then capitulates somewhat and acknowledges that not all women are emotion-based voids. He cites Colleen Duran, Terry Wood, and Coco Chanel as examples of exceptions. It is then stated that sensible behavior happens far more often in men than in women, despite these exceptions. Sim claims this opinion is neither bigotry nor sexism. He claims there is empirical evidence to support this position. Five comparative examples are then supplied. All examples ignore the historical context of these comparisons, and none are quantified. They are statements of fact without evidence to support them. Again, this is an opinion, it's not science, nor anything resembling the scientific process. The empirical data is not just questionable, it's non-existent. Irony arises as Sim struggles with intellectual dissonance. Quote, No general observation could be considered sound if there existed an anecdotal refutation. Unquote. This is ironic because the entirety of Reed's is both a generalized observation, or opinion, using anecdotes as evidence. According to his reasoning, this is a symptom of the female emotional void. Overpopulation is argued as an example of Western society being controlled by women. It is claimed that birth is female and death is male. Logically, if Western society were actually controlled by men, there would be a balanced population, not overpopulation. This is followed by an anecdote where the cartoonist, Jeff Smith, disagrees with Sim's premise concerning death and birth. A newspaper article concerning the cleanup of seals following an oil spill is mentioned. Allegedly, one seal was cleaned, released to the wild, and immediately eaten by a killer whale. It's implied this effort was a waste of time and money. Notably, Sim does mention the possibility that this news item is apocryphal. Despite that, it is then used to illustrate the absurdity of considering life as something that needs preservation. For the record, this seal story has been disproven. It never occurred. A Windsor McKay illustration is used to solidify the notion that death is a necessary function. Again, it's reiterated that life, as personified by overpopulation, is way out of balance. This is a symptom of an emotion-based reasoning system. The next portion continues to assert this notion, using examples of general paranoia concerning personal safety, yet another symptom of an emotion-based reasoning system. Finally, fear is suggested as one more symptom of an emotion-based reasoning system. Two non-sequiturs follow. Sim admits that his alleged reasonable arguments are trumped thoroughly by emotional arguments, because one cannot reason with emotion. This is followed by two forced metaphorical instances where a female void has no idea what to do next. Quite honestly, it is a straw man example, and quite petty at its core. For the remainder of this concluding episode, Sim vaguely reiterates his points, and then he introduces a young lady he refers to as the exception. 
First, he concedes that his opinion may be considered controversial, but it's one he's maintained for many years, and he's been waiting for the opportunity to present it in Cerebus. He also concedes there may be severe repercussions for expressing this opinion in print. He ends with a callout to feed the light and reject the void. One cannot sustain both. The final few paragraphs suggest this rambling essay has inspired the light and several others. Now, the previously mentioned exception has to be examined somewhat. In recent years, Sim has admitted to forming a relationship with a 13-year-old girl shortly before his marriage fell apart in the early 80s. This girl, whom he became infatuated with, is actually the subject of a few photographs that appear in service number 78. Roughly around the time of Reed's, she was about to, or had just become the age of consent. Prior to that, as some might point out, Sim had been grooming her. Objectively, the details are highly vague concerning their involvement for, roughly, an eight-year period. It was serious enough that Sim considered moving to England while she attended university there. He didn't, but it was something he seriously considered. That is not a venture taken on a whim. So it implies a connection that is far more in-depth than surface-level attraction. However, the nature of that connection is a matter of speculation. Within that context, the concluding portion of Reed's sounds like a predator quite pleased with the prey he's captured. That is, presuming the exception in question is this young lady. In the aftermath of this rant, sales for Cerebus dropped. It has been alleged that roughly half the readership dropped the title over the next year. Publicly available sales figures are quite incomplete for this period. All that can be stated with some certainty is that Cerebus had roughly 20,000 readers at the time of Reed's. By the time the series was nearing its end a decade later, Cerebus was selling just over 6,000 copies per month. Due to intense criticism, Sim has clarified that he is not a misogynist. He is an anti-feminist. Reeds criticizes a political movement, not a gender. One can accept that clarification as intellectually dishonest hair-splitting, or one could point out that he specifically mentions women, not feminists, in that essay. Either way, it's difficult to accept that clarification on its merits. To this end, Sim wrote an essay titled Tangent. This essay appeared in issue number 265 of Cerebus. It is a full elaboration of his point of view. However, Tangent reads like someone desperately trying to win an argument they've already lost. In the end, all he's doing is arguing with himself. Regardless, Tangent did nothing but solidify everyone's previously held opinion of Sim. In fact, it may have made his reputation quite a lot worse. The level of disdain reached a point where Sim required those that desired to communicate with him to sign an online petition stating they did not believe he was a misogynist. This was quite a low point for the creator, who practically had to coerce people into defending him. According to the Wayback Machine, after eight years, this petition had over 2,000 signatures. It is no longer available. For those interested, the entire text parts of Reed's and the Tangent Essay are available online. Links to those pieces are in the description below as are other points of interest. Once Cerebus concluded, Sim continued to produce work. He did this mainly to pay off his collaborator, Gerhard, who opted to sell his share in Cerebus rather than to continually accept royalties. From the little information available, most of it from Sim himself, it appears Gerhard tolerated Dave in the years following the publication of Reed's, and that tolerance was stretched thin by the time the series concluded. This may be one reason why Gerhardt was always a silent partner, one who did very few interviews and rarely discussed the Cerebus project. Possibly, he didn't want to be put in a position to defend or defer comment on Dave's point of view concerning women. It's only common sense that you don't openly disagree with your employer in public. However, this is speculation. His actual opinion isn't in the public record, as far as one can tell. Sim produced one graphic novel, Juden House, and one ongoing series, Glamour Puss with Zutanapus being a spin-off of that title. Recently, he's published a Fumetti-style comic called Cerebus in Hell? Of those four titles, Glamourpus was possibly the most successful. Its first issue sold over 16,000 copies. But by the time the series concluded with the 26th issue, it was barely selling 2,000 copies. It is safe to suggest that public interest in Sim's work is practically non-existent. In fact, within the final issue of Glamourpus, Sim essentially admitted his career was over. He has spent the bulk of his time in recent years ensuring Cerebus remains available and preserved well into the future. All of his efforts seem to be geared towards that goal. Due to Reed's and all that followed, Cerebus has disappeared from any public discussion. 
It's only mentioned to highlight the controversy surrounding Dave Sim. Any potential legacy it may have obtained is tarnished, and its accomplishments as an amazing example of the medium are mostly forgotten, or mentioned with begrudging respect and a multitude of stipulations. Reeds provides a context for the final third of the Cerebus saga that is hard to overlook. Either one has to be generous and put aside the artist for the sake of the art, or one agrees with Sim's point of view and enjoys the ensuing examination of women doing terrible things. Almost ironically, had the text portions of Reed's not been part of Cerebus, and had the latter third of the series run exactly as it had, the comic may have been considered a timeless classic that explored how any faction in control will abuse its power. Instead, it comes off as a bitter writer belittling an entire gender.